Hi, everybody, and welcome to our February Ambassador Briefing. Uh, today, we have uh, two special presenters, uh, Julie Puzo and uh, Mike Spigler, who lead uh, two departments for us at AKF, and they will share uh, more about the specific work of their departments and just the, the great work that AKF does overall. Uh, and when, when they are done, uh, we will have a Q&A for anybody uh, who has any questions, and then after that, uh, I will answer any questions you have about the Kenya Action Summit coming up and um, anything else really. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over uh, to Julie. Thanks, Ben. Um, my name is uh, Julie Puzo. I am the Chief Development Officer here at AKF. Uh, this year, uh, this July, I will have been here 10 years um, and uh, I have a great team. Uh, I see at least one person, Megan, uh, is on this call from my group. Um, and so today, um, Mike and I are gonna be talking a little bit more just about some of the uh, different things that AKF does and uh, some other ways to get involved. Um, Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself and, uh, and then I'll share the slides. Hi everyone, Mike Spigler, Vice President of Patient Support and Education for AKF. I'm closing in on, I guess it'll be 10 years coming up into this year, but also was here five years in the early 2000s too, which has given me kind of unique perspective to see how far the the field has really changed and the options are for 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 those living with kidney disease that didn't exist before. So glad to get you updated on what we're doing here, ACAF, to keep that momentum going. Thanks. All right. Hopefully everybody can see my screen now. It's working. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. So um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of uh, the sort of overview. Oh, yeah. I know oh, you guys yeah. know a lot about ACAF, but there may be some of you that are newer. Um, and so just a little bit overview of, of some of the things that we do in our premise. And then Mike will talk about some specific programs. Um, let's see if I can get my slides to change. So ACAF really views ourselves as a convener in the community. Um, we are focused on making change. We want to address the crisis in kidney disease uh, head on um, and also make sure that we're helping people live healthier lives. And we do that through educational resources, um, through advocating, uh, which you are all doing at state and federal levels, and then raising money uh, to make sure that we can fund all of the things that we need to do. So this is a little bit of a history of AKF. We had our 50th anniversary just a couple of years ago. Um, and so these are just some milestones. We were, you know, we were founded in, in 1971. We had our first big national awareness campaign in 1980. Um, exciting, uh, 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 area in the clinical scientists nephrology. That program was launched in 1988, um, and we have sent through uh, a countless number of um, of nephrologists uh, to the through this program that really have become leaders in the field today. Um, we established our health insurance program in '97. Um, we have had our first four star rating in 2003, and that has not stopped since. Uh, so we are now uh, we'll, we have had 21 of those uh, four star ratings. Uh, we were named a top health charity in 2015, and that's continued every year as well. And then just one of the milestones from last year um, is that we were enabled uh, over 1,800 uh, patients to have transplant. And Mike's going to talk about that a little bit more uh, in a bit. So AKF really looks at itself as a 360 to 5 degree organization, meaning we are there for patients and their families and caregivers, um, no matter where they are in the kidney disease stage. So we're working on areas such as awareness, advocacy, which again, you all work on, and we thank you for our prevention and education programs for, for patients. We have professional education programs uh, for our caregivers, medical professionals, a strong research program, as I just talked about in the clinical science and sophrology, and then our financial assistance program. So we really wanna make sure that from prevention to post-transplant living, and no matter what area it is that you're looking for, information or assistance or to get involved, the AKF has a place for you. And we have three guiding principles. Um, one is we are community focused. We want to make sure that we are seeking to educate and engage patients and make sure that we're learning from their experiences uh, as we inform our work. It is really of no value for us to sit around a conference room table and decide what somebody else needs. We have to talk to the people who are looking to access those programs to make sure that we're doing what is most helpful to them. Um, we are a thought leader. And I this is the second time I'll use the word convening. 
Um, it's been very important to AKF to bring um, all of the top groups together and individuals together to make sure that we have the best and brightest around a table when we're trying to solve a problem or we're trying to figure out what sort of action we want to take. And uh, we've been really proud to be in that position for many years. And then finally, we're results driven. Um, we want to make sure that the work we do is strategic, it's thoughtful, um, but that it has impact and it has return on investment to improving kidney care and patient outcomes. Um, so again, not doing work for the sake of work, but making sure that everything is actionable and um, has a metric around it so that we can see, are we being successful in what we're doing? Um, and then finally, uh, we are just results driven in a variety of ways. And I won't read all of these things here, um, but you know everything from, again, having an incredibly strong ambassador program to working closely with corporate industry to we've had over 13 million people uh, rely on our website for health information. Um, we have over a million people monthly um, just accessing our education campaigns. Um, and, you know, a variety of other areas, our disaster relief program has provided close to four and a half million dollars in just since 2020, um, including um, our uh, uh, coronavirus emergency fund that we ran through 2020. So um, we really feel proud of these numbers. We also know that these numbers would not be possible without donors, without advocates and other volunteers that are helping us get to where we're going. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike for the next few slides. Mike, just let me know when you're ready to change. And he's going to talk specifically about some of our programs. I'm muted, so thank you. Um, thank you, Julie. So I'll talk a little bit about some of our overall kind of patient and um, our healthcare professional work that we do. And I'll do some deeper dives into some of the other areas in just a little bit. Um, but, you know, we you saw kind of the different areas in which we address this, but we also do it from a lot of different tactics on the patient side of things. We have uh, campaigns that we create. Um, you may have seen some of these, like you see Beyond Bananas uh, on the screen. We also have Act on Anemia, Galpful, uh, some of our other campaigns, really just to try to give some interest and, and some lightheartedness to some of these topics that people may not be familiar uh, about. Uh, and have some information there for it. Obviously, several of you on this call have uh, participated in uh, videos that we've done uh, for AKF. It's it, we really feel it's important to be able to, um, you know, give the the perspective of those living with kidney disease um, from their own words as much as we can. Um, events like this on the public education side from a webinar series. Um, you know, we've also. From all the way from you know drug development and clinical trial recruitment all the way to when something comes in market uh, we have a wide range of, of educational uh, materials there um, kidney kitchens another great example of the work we do for those living with kidney disease if, if you're not familiar with that program you know we have um, uh, hundreds of recipes now on that website that have all been uh, created by a dietitian uh, cooked by a professional chef uh, I really make sure that they're they're useful there and you can sort by all kinds of different things from types of meal to um, whatever you're trying to uh, limit potassium, phosphorus, protein in your diet. Um, and, you know, with anything, it, not everything can just be put at the feet of those living with kidney disease, right? We need to educate healthcare professionals to give the best care that they can as well. Yeah. And we do that in lots of different ways. Um, we have continuing med medical education courses that are for physicians and nurse practitioners, PAs. We have uh, CE courses for nurses, dietitians, social workers, um, and our kidney health coach program, which I know many of you are um, already signed up for and, and have been trained by. Um, but that's also has some uh, continuing education credits available for healthcare professionals as well, because we were seeing a lot of professionals incorporate some of that in what they're doing. Julie already talked about our CSN program. Um, and then we also have um, several other things. Um, we have a professional component for dietitians for Kidney Kitchen as well. Next slide. Oh. There you go. Thank you. One of the things that uh, I think has set ACAF apart for really our entire history is the fact that we have been giving um, those from underserved communities uh, a hand up in in and really getting some equity um, for the healthcare. We've done that through our health insurance premium program. Um, we have 
many more patients from underserved communities that receive a transplant than the general pool from that program. We've been doing screening programs and other events in the community uh, since I was here the first time in the early 2000s. So this has really been uh, an area that we focused on. Um, but during the pandemic and as as there um, after the the George Floyd murder and some other issues that that popped up, we really wanted to make a concerted effort and really laser focus into four areas. And our kidney health for all program is what came out of that. So we are focusing on four areas of inequities in kidney disease, one around prevention and disease management. Uh, for years before the pandemic, we had the nation's largest screening program. Um, the pandemic pretty much put an end to that for multiple reasons, but we wanted to continue to focus on that um, and, and try to aim for um, getting some equity in that area. From home dialysis, um, as you know, the US just as a whole, lags behind in home dialysis usage, um, but it's even more prominent uh, in those underserved communities in Black and Hispanic uh, populations especially. And making sure that we are getting equi equitable access to home dialysis is an important part of what we are doing. Um, we want to make sure that we have adequate representation in clinical trials. Um, one of the things, we certainly have created lots of education on clinical trials for uh, the community that we serve. But as I mentioned in the slide before, we've also been really, really helpful to some of these early uh, biopharma companies in finding patients uh, to participate in trials uh, and using our very diverse um, community that we serve to help make sure that we are getting adequate representation. And finally, as I mentioned, transplant access. Um, so our team has created some materials on that. But again, I mentioned, um, you know, we have gotten, about any, depending on the year, six to seven percent or so of all the kidney transplants in the U.S. Uh, come about in, in large part because of our um, our health insurance premium program. Um, and we're very, very proud of that. And if you look at those that are transplanting, they are um, much more likely to be from those underserved communities. Next slide, please. So as part of this effort, we launched our Kidney Health for All website. If you've not visited, I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, we've been hosting um, in-person ambassador trainings uh, in nine states that the uh, government affairs team has been doing. Um, you know, we've been pushing with the United States Preventative Services Task Force to try to create a better plan for getting more people screened for chronic kidney disease. I'm sure if I did a poll here of many of you on the call, a lot of you probably did not find out about your kidney disease until it was pretty far down the line. Uh, and that's because there really isn't very clear guidelines for who should be screened for kidney disease uh, and when. Unless you have diabetes, it's just not something that's happening very often. I actually just read an article uh, yesterday that in Japan, they do urine screening starting in elementary school kids, middle school, high school kids there. So, you know, we are way, way, way lagging behind uh, in early chronic kidney disease screening. Um, we have built a health equity coalition that includes large organizations like the American Diabetes Association, down to smaller student-run uh, uh, kidney health screening groups at various universities. Um, I mentioned our Kidney Health Coach Program. Um, we've uh, offered some health equity grants to coaches and to some organizations to bring the Kidney Health Coach trainings to at-risk communities um, and um, really trying to include these health equity pillars uh, in the work we do for Kidney Action Week. Uh, you can see some of those there. Um, and we've also done some more work with some partners on diversity and, and clinical trials. Um, and as part of the home dialysis focus of this effort, uh, we've also um, uh, partnered with the Home Dialyzers United uh, to host our Dialysis at Home Summit uh, for two years now. Next slide, please. So again, as we move forward, uh, actually, you'll be very, uh, you're one of the first uh, groups probably to hear this, but we will be launching a national PR campaign uh, with some um, streaming uh, service ads, some TV ads, radio ads um, uh, about uh, prevention and progression of kidney disease in underserved communities. So we're targeting those at those underserved communities. That's going to be launching uh, in March. Um, we hope to expand that kidney health coach grant program to a broader range of individuals. So um, if you're not already a kidney health coach, get trained. Um, and if you're interested in when that uh, next kind of call for proposals come out, do that because there are, is some funding to bring that, that work to your local community. Uh, we will be hosting our third annual Dialysis at Home Summit uh, in the fall. I continue our home dialysis decision aid that we created as part of this, this work, which is already up on the Kidney Health for All site. Uh, and again, 
uh, continuing to bring awareness about clinical trials uh, to the populations that most need it um, and continuing to build on our, our very successful transplant toolkit um, that's due to launch um, next month as well. Next slide, please. So I'm always told by Julie to try to, to ramp it down on this slide because this is one of my favorite programs that we do here and I'll try to be brief with it. But, um, you know, we did a survey of about, of all of our, um, all of those that are in our house file here. And we asked them if they knew what caused their kidney disease. And 22% of them said they had no idea. No one ever told them uh, what caused their kidney disease. We did a survey of healthcare professionals. We found that 15% uh, of the healthcare, they said, well, the healthcare professional said 15% of their patients with chronic kidney disease, they had no clue what caused it. They haven't really done the workup or, or couldn't be able to, couldn't figure out what the cause was for kidney disease. Um, and if, and this is mirrors what we found in our own health insurance premium program. We had about 14% of patients there who had no idea what caused their kidney disease. And if you don't know what caused your kidney disease and you don't understand that there may be a rare disease or some other component causing uh, kidney disease, um, that leads to lots of issues. You're not able to manage comorbidities. You're not able to get into trials or treatments that may be available. There may be some family planning decisions uh, that you want to make based on what you have. And, you know, if you get a transplant and you have a rare disease that's never been identified, you know, there could be a chance that, that rare disease attacks the new kidney as well. So we have to think through all of those things and it's important. Um, but there really hadn't been any work in this area until we started this uh, back in 2020. So uh, we created a, um, an initial work group that held a summit in December of, of 2020, more, more than 100 different leaders. Um, we came together, we put out a roadmap for how to address this, and then we got to work. Uh, we developed, we, there are kind of three areas this coalesced around. There are some areas around uh, public policy, around uh, educating healthcare professionals, and of course, educating those with kidney disease uh, and those that care for them. Next slide, please. So you can see some of the things that we're doing. This this has been four years in the in in the running. We just held our first finally after the pandemic in person summit uh, on in December of of last year. Um, we've created some CME courses that have been very very uh, well received by healthcare professionals. We're uh, well over fifteen thousand completions uh, on those courses. Really trying to educate healthcare professionals that you know, not all kidney disease is the same. If you see a young person come in or someone whose kidney disease is rapidly progressing, you know, what can we do to try to address that? How do you get them to nephrologist? What tests should be done? Really trying to get them the workup that they need. Uh, on the patients and caregivers side of things, um, we are scheduled, I think it's March 28th, if we're able to keep to the schedule, to launch our new Know Your Cause uh, website. Lots of information. Um, about helping people understand that the cause of the kidney disease is very important. And we're going to be tying it to our Know Your Kidneys website. So no matter where you kind of come into our site and learning about kidney disease, we're putting uh, the importance of knowing your cause kind of uh, first and foremost. Um, and as part of that, we've been partnering with lots of the rare kidney disease organizations to help us uh, think through what needs to be on that site. Um, you're probably very familiar with the public policy work that's been doing, uh, been going on. Um, we'll be hosting our second uh, UCKD rare disease fly in uh, in September uh, and pushing on a couple different uh, legislative areas uh, in that space. We've been partnering with NEFCURE uh, on their new era of preventing kidney disease act, which would create, among other things, a center of excellence uh, at NIDDK, which is the NIH um, group that focuses on on kidney disease, but creating a center of excellence on rare kidney disease. Uh, and also trying to get genetic counselors covered through Medicare. Believe it or not, they currently are not. So those are two areas among many that we're pushing for there. Uh, and then we'll be having our second in-person summit um, coming up this year as well. Next slide, please. Our patient access initiative. So it's great that we're helping get pa patients enrolled in trials. It's great that we're seeing innovation. Um, but none of that matters if you can't actually get to the new drug or device once it's created. So uh, the government affairs team has been leading this effort, our patient access initiative, to try to make sure that um, patients are identified early, that they know about new innovations that are coming out, um, that the FDA and CMS are doing whatever they can to approve these uh, drugs and devices when they make sense, but making sure that actually someone is paying for them. Um, I see on Twitter all the time, we have these great new drugs for managing diabetic kidney disease. 
and the hoops that I see on social media of physicians having to jump through to get them covered for their patients is insane. So this is the re one of the many reasons that we're taking on the patient access initiative. Um, we held our first summit last year, uh, and we'll do the same uh, coming up this year to really continue the trajectory of that program. Next slide, please. Uh, and coming up very soon, um, March 18th to the 21st is our Kidney Action Week. Or, so, sorry for the 22nd, is our Kidney Action Week. This is a virtual free program. Um, in previous years, you know, if you've been a part of it, you probably know that our, our kind of our agenda kind of bounced around a lot. Um, we really wanted to segment the days off so it made sense and there were kind of themes to each day. So you can see that's what we've done this year. First year is about living well with, with CKD, so things about diabetes and kidney disease, women's health, high blood pressure and kidney disease. Our second day is being led by the government affairs team, so we hope all of you are going to join in with that. Um, but it's it's how to get involved to try to help move all this work forward. Our third day is really our kidney health for all day and, and talking about health equity um, and how that impacts kidney failure. Uh, on the fourth day, we're doing, uh, actually the last two days are both new for us. Uh, day four is aimed at healthcare professionals. We were getting a lot of healthcare professionals already joining this and learning about it, but we really wanted to make a, an effort to educate them um, on the what we felt were the really important burning topics of the day. So we have a day aimed at healthcare professionals on day four. And on day five, it's all about upcoming uh, and new innovations that are coming to the space. Um, so I don't know if any of you attended the Kidney X uh, meeting in DC this year. But they kind of have these quick hit 15 minute um, innovation sessions, like four at a time, and there'll be a panel and we talk about them. It allows you to get a little bit of sense of what's coming and getting excited and kind of see the work that AKF and others are doing to help path uh, make a path forward for these innovations. So you can learn about those and kind of see uh, what's coming around the bend. Next slide, please. I mentioned our Know Your Kidneys program. That is our program uh, that's been around for a, a while now, but it was really aimed at diabetic kidney disease, uh, hypertensive kidney disease, kind of the quote unquote traditional kidney disease. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we are now adding this Know Your Cause piece to it as well. So you'll come into that this area, there'll, there'll be interactive tools in each of those three spaces. For those that you don't know anything about kidney disease, you're not sure you have it, there'll be some tools and calculators you can put in your numbers. Uh, and then we immediately start saying, okay, let's help you figure out now what caused your kidney disease. And then once you know that, a know your plan site to help develop a plan on how to address it, whether it be um, quote unquote traditional kidney disease or more of a rare kidney disease. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, we are lucky to have the architect of our camp program here. So I'm actually gonna turn it over to Megan to talk a little bit about uh, what we are doing for uh, kids with kidney disease. Yes, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, we uh, have this exciting program. Um, I recognize a couple of parents on here who may have kids in our program. Um, but we started a national virtual camp program for our pediatric kidney patients. It really was born uh, during COVID because, um, you know, COVID was so isolating for kidney patients, but especially for our youngest kidney patients and not being able to go to school, not being able to see friends. And so, uh, we started this program with just a couple hospitals across the country just to test it out, see how it would go. And um, we actually ended 2023 with over 200 campers um, registered from over 25 different states. And um, so we have kids that um, can see ages 4 to 19 that come. Um, we have uh, children who are CKD patients, dialysis patients transplant, post-transplant patients. Um, and we invite them to come every month. We do three sessions a month. Um, we try and keep it the third week of the month on Mondays and Fridays um, to allow for flexibility with um, other activities or doctor's appointments, things like that. Um, and we actually have some children um, in Texas who join us from camp while they're receiving dialysis. And so um, this is a, a great distraction for them um, this month, we actually made friendship bracelets, and so our campers made bracelets, and they filled out a little card about themselves, and we're going to be mailing them to other campers around the country so they get to know each other and have a little piece um, of jewelry that a friend made them. So um, in addition to uh, our national camp, we also have a cystinosis spinoff camp, 
So we have about 20 cystinosis pediatric patients who join us um, in 2024. We're doing it once a quarter. Um, and so they're able to connect with patients that um, have cystinosis. It's such a rare disease, just connect in a smaller group. Um, and we are loving camp. We invite you if anybody is interested, um, you know, to join us for a camp session. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for these kids. Um, you'll hear them talk about, oh, I need to jump off because I need to take my medicine or I was at my doctor and this is the medicine I'm taking and all the kids understand and they can have conversations with each other and not, not feel um, like they're talking a different language. And so we're really excited about this camp and um, please reach out if you have any questions um, about camp. Thank you, Megan. So we're just about done here. I just, again, wanted to uh, remind folks, I keep using the words results driven, um, but we really want to make the most impact for the kidney community. And we're really proud of the fact that we spend 97 cents of every dollar that's raised here on patients and programs. Um, we have all of these accolades that you can see here. Um, and it's really important to us that, you know, we uh, rely on donations from individuals and corporations and foundations to make the organization run. And it's important to us that we spend that money wisely and that uh, we make sure that we are a really good steward of that donor dollar. And so there are, I want to talk just a little bit about some other ways that you might be able to help the organization. I know that you are very much involved as advocates and we again cannot thank you enough for that. But we do have some interesting uh, opportunities for us. Obviously, AKF again, the programs, all the, doc, all the programs and items that um, Mike talked about, uh, again, only happen because of the donors that we have. So certainly if you're interested in, in uh, giving to AKF, uh, that's something we obviously are very uh, would, much would appreciate. Um, there's also an opportunity for you to fundraise for AKF, which is reaching out to your community and asking them to support this organization because it's an organization, a cause that's important to you. And uh, we are actually going to be working um, with Ben um, and Eric to put together um, a committee uh, of advocates to talk about what would be the best ways for you all to fundraise, what would be the areas that are most interesting, and what kind of tools and activities would you need. We currently have an online platform uh, on uh, called Kidney Nation um, that you can create a fundraising page for. From that platform, you can also host an event and we would work with you to help you figure out how to do that. Um, and then we have 37 Mile Challenge. So many of you may be familiar with this. Um, we do this once or twice a year. Um, and so individuals are challenged to walk 37 miles in a month in honor of the 37 million people with kidney disease while also raising funds for AKF. And so in 2023, we raised over $150,000 and we had more than 5,000 people who were walking and fundraising with us um, throughout the year. So it was definitely an exciting op opportunity. And there's a great closed Facebook group when you register for Thursday Mile Challenge and everybody's really encouraging. And I would say the bulk of people uh, who are fundraising and walking for AKF are patients um, and then their families. So it really is a great program. And so that's it for us. Um, so wanted to thank everybody for their time um, and then uh, open it up for questions, if there are any. And just as a reminder, if you have questions, uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask, or you can put them in the chat and I will uh, follow up. Hi, Robin Toles here. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. hi Robin. Yes, hi. Thank you for all of the great information. Uh, my question is towards uh, advocacy. Uh, is there any push to try to work with um, healthcare professionals on developing or continuing to develop antibodies um, for um, COVID-19? Uh, many of us, especially transplant patients, cannot take um, I think it's tax of it if you get COVID-19. Um, you can only, you, you either have to write it out or you have to severely adjust the dose because it interacts with um, tacrolimus. And, but there's, there's no push for antibodies right now. And that's severely affecting, uh, you know, the lives of us, of us who actually have uh, transplants. It actually put me in the hospital um, for about uh, 10 days because I 
could not recover. I developed um, sepsis. Um, the hospital bill was about $50,000. Thank God I have insurance, but it was very serious. Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 you're hundred percent right about the, the need for the antibodies and I actually just for innovations for transplant recipients, just overall, uh, is not great right now. Right. I mean, you, you're pretty much generic drugs that put you at risk for, for cancer and all kinds of things that just exist right now. So it absolutely is a problem. I don't, um, Ben, I don't know if you know, if there's any legislation or push for anything that's happening that, uh, uh at the federal level I, I don't know the answer to that um i'll stop my head i do not believe so but um it, it's something that uh you know robin we can talk later and, and see if there's if that's something that could be uh could be produced okay all right thank you Anything else, Mike or I can answer um, regarding to programs at AKF or anything yes. else? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, this is Christy Ramos. Um, I have two questions, actually. You know, for the unknown uh, causes of kidney disease, um, I got diagnosed with vesicle uterine reflux, but I don't understand. They don't know the cause of vesicle uterine reflux. I had got diagnosed when my kidney function was past 50 and I had to have a reimplantation of uterus. And that was a long time ago when I was 20. And um, they, they don't uh, count that as a, I mean, it's a partial treatment or a, a temporary treatment and it lasted 10 years. But after that, I mean, you still, I still get infections all the time. So I just don't know if there's any, funding or anything that they do to even look into vesicle reflux? I'd have to look into that. But actually, what you just described is actually kind of the, the next phase of what we are trying to just start thinking about with that project, because so many patients don't even get a diagnosis, right? You at least have a name right. that you put on it. Yeah. But, it took me a yeah. <laughs> right. But um, the next thing is, you know, what is the actual underlying cause of it? I mean, even, you right. know, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or FSGS, um, right. you know, we have to figure out what, what is the cause of that? What's the underlying cause of it? You know, is it, is it, you know, are there genetic impl implications for it? So that is something we're starting to think about as kind of what the next layer of this project might be as we move forward. The first piece is just at least trying to get patients to understand that, um, you know, not all kidney disease is the same and make sure healthcare professionals aren't doing that. The, the biggest case that we usually see are, are someone that will go to the emergency room and not feel well, right? And they're told, well, you know, you, you're going to need to start dialysis soon or need to start dialysis tomorrow. And no one ever does a workup. And you walk into the emergency right. room, your blood pressure's through the roof, and, and the, the, doc, the ER doc goes, ah, must be blood pressure. And, and many people don't ever follow up on it, right? So just trying to get that piece has been a huge hurdle that we're trying to overcome. But but I hear you and I understand the the frustration of under, what is the underlying cause underneath of the diagnosis is is equally important, truly. Um, but I don't I mean, know if to it or if there's any research happening right now, to be honest. Okay. I mean, that's how I found out I was going to get kidney disease because I got rushed to the ER, fainted in the garage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, also, it's not about the, um, uh, the causes, but kidney health coach. Do you have to be, to get the training, do you have to be a professional in no. the healthcare system? No, okay. you absolutely don't. And, and actually, in fact, that program started with the, not that not being the intention at all. Uh, we initially developed that program for really to, to be, you know, volunteers like yourselves that are going out right. and doing this, um, well, you know, church leaders. And what we so found is we had so many physicians and, and like, you know, nurses and um, diabetes educators that were using it. We said we might as well, you know, take some energy around this and, and offer credits for it, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the only thing, the only reason I ask is um, NKF, I also do advocacy for NKF. And like back in, I think 2008, maybe 2010, I used to do kidney health classes uh, for like um, health fairs and for employers mm -hmm. that send their people to these classes. And I would be the, the one that taught the classes. So I'm just wondering if you need to, if I need to be a nurse, because I yeah. used to work with one of them. Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, how do I get to know more about that? 
Uh, so just go to our ACAF website, um, or I'm sure Ben can send it to you after the fact, but it's um, our kidney health coach um, page, and you can just sign up. It's all free to do. Yeah, I'll make sure you get the info, Christy. And so, uh, Mike, uh, we have a question here in the chat from Kyle. Lots of great new content and resources available and coming down the line. What are the plans, timelines, if any, to make these resources available via – uh, at a minimum video, your website in various languages for patients where English may not be their native or primary language? So the quick answer is uh, for Spanish, we have, I would, I'm trying to be conservative so I don't misspeak, but at least 75%, if not more, way more than that, of all of our materials that are is in Spanish. It's kind of standard operating procedure for us to do that. We have very early in a couple of different areas started to do um, some of that, so, some things in other languages, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a large task to take on. And, um, it just, it's honestly, it's a resource limitation more than anything else, because once you translate it, when you update it now, it's, you know, you're not just updating one website, you're updating two, three, five, 20, 30. Um, so it's, it's difficult right now. English and Spanish is our focus. I would love to, if resource allows to, to expand other languages moving forward. But then we have a question from a few folks about if these slides are shareable, that if we can share them with folks. Uh, yeah, we should be able to do that. Sure. Okay. Um, I think that's it for questions for Julie and Mike. So I'd like to thank the both of you for, for joining us today. Um, and then I will go ahead and talk about the uh, Kidney Action Summit. Um, so, much. all right, bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, so we we got some questions um, in the chat about uh, Kidney Action Summit. Um, applications are still being accepted. Um, I believe tomorrow is the the deadline to apply, um, but we can. We, we can extend it uh, a little bit if some folks uh, haven't had a chance to do it yet. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Oh, uh, Catherine, I see you have a hand up. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I probably should have asked this earlier, but one of the things that was mentioned in the presentation was urine tests for kids in Japan have any of your researchers that you're funding advocated for widespread urine screening? Because I work at the Indiana University Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center and my laboratory, we're focusing on creating a 24-hour urine-based assay that detects circulating tumor DNA. And we use large volume urine. And one of the issues that we've been running into just has been trying to convince funders that this is something people would do. And I was wondering if you guys were having issues just with getting people to take that leap and accept urine testing as something that's a viable disease screening tool. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think we've run into any issues of people accepting urine screening as a uh, urine testing as a disease screening tool. Um, but I don't know if it is required under different insurance plans or not. I, I don't know of any legislation to in, in make it mandatory. Um, but personally, from when I've gotten um, physicals in the past, I don't believe I've done a urine test recently. Um, and But I used to do it all the time. So I don't know if that's an insurance thing or what. Uh, but I, I don't know of any big push to to do them more often. Well, I'll ask my boss about that, but we are in the we're still in the clinical trials, preclinical trials phase. <laughs> All right, so a question from Brianna Sanchez. I have a question. Is there a resource for patients pre-dialysis to speak to dialysis patients? Um we do not have that, but if you're asking for yourself, uh, we are more than happy to connect you um, with somebody who um, is currently a dialysis patient that can answer any questions you might have. Um, we 
to be honest, we used to do that a lot more often. We haven't had that many requests for that recently, um, but we have a a whole bunch of volunteers um, who are more than happy to to speak with folks wherever they are in their their kidney disease journey. Um, so, Brianna, if that is you, you can email me, message me, and then I'll I'll talk to you. Then we'll find a match for you. Yeah, I did send you an email, but I'm sure you get thousands of emails. So I'm like, I don't know if it just had gotten spammed or something, right. but it I, is for a patient. Okay, I, I did not see it, so we'll, we'll uh, ask. Awesome, okay. thank you so much. Um, Tamara Walker, please tell us more about the AKF Green Pain Room for those who are currently on dialysis. What's the process to enroll? Um, so for folks who are not receiving the charitable premium assistance uh, from us, um, you already have to be on dialysis and have selected your insurance plan. And then there are other uh, income uh, qualifications uh, to receive the financial assistance. Um, but overall, um, it is uh, a relatively easy system because well, you know, we have that money from donations that is for people to be able to afford their care. So uh, we don't want to make folks jump through too many hurdles to do it. Um, but if anyone uh, is looking for more info on that, I what I like to do is uh, get you on the phone and then I will sign you up for an appointment with the patient services department and uh, they will be able to answer all your specific uh, application and requirement questions about that. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Um, any questions about Kidney Action Summit? Uh, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. So I'm new to all of this. I'm George McClure, and um, I'm new to all of this. And I had uh, filled out one of the forms, and it, it I filled out one that was a patient. I guess I, I filled it out as a patient. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went out to go and look for some of the other things, and I couldn't find them. So I went out, I filled out for an ambassador and I filled out, I just filled out a bunch of stuff. How can I tell like what is legit and what's not? Because I just got a, a, a message saying that something got canceled. And I'm I'm pretty confused right now because I filled out a ton of stuff. Um, so we definitely have your info from uh, being an ambassador. We have your application for um, the Kidney Action Summit. Um, but can you forward me that message that you got about something being canceled? Um, so I, I, I think it's the patient portion. Is that that was the, I didn't uh, mean to fill that one out. I mean, but I think it's uh, the patient portion. I, I'm, uh, th that I, I would have to see. I'm not sure. Um, okay, I can send it. That is, but please forward it on to me, and I'd be glad to. Um, uh, glad to look into it and help you out. Thank you. Any other uh, questions here? I'm getting the link right now for folks to apply for the Kidney Action Summit who have not done it yet. Give me one second here. Oh, there it is. Um, anyone else have any questions about Kidney Action Summit? Um, so just to rehash, um, we haven't read the applications yet. We just check to see who everyone's uh, member of Congress is because there are uh, specific members uh, that we've, we've shared in the past that we are targeting because we want to get the meetings with them. Um, and that is always the, the number one thing uh, we look for when making the selections um, because, you know, the, the biggest point of the uh, Kidney Action Summit is to get uh, ambassadors in front of those legislators and their staff members uh, that are important to us to try and advance or introduce uh, can you find the legislation. So the spaces, uh, Candace, uh, we don't have uh, any hybrid or virtual uh, stuff this year for the summit. Uh, that's because the the trainings are trainings we've we do sort of piecemeal throughout the year. Um, and then the meetings themselves are, uh, just in person. Um, yeah, so, so we accept people based on their member of Congress first um, and 
we, then we sort of work backwards from there. We see how many spots we have left. We don't have an exact number, um, but we can budget wise, we can pay for the you know flight hotel and everything for about 20 folks, maybe 22. Um, so, you know, we look and see how many spots are taken up by members, uh, by ambassadors whose members we have to get to. Um, and then after that, we look for sort of members that we would like to get in front of. And then after that, we sort of just try to get a balance of uh, gender, race, uh, your exper experiences with kidney disease. So we look for uh, altruistic donors, living donors, living donor recipients, um, uh, deceased donor recipients, people on dialysis, uh, people pre uh, dialysis. So we, we really look for a good cross section of the, the kidney community. Um, and then we also try to have a mix of folks who are, who have attended uh, the Kidney Action Summit in the past, and then some who have not. Uh, the only sort of easier way uh, to get accepted is if you're in very short driving distance um, from the hotel we use in Arlington, Virginia. So we do accept uh, some more folks from North Virginia and Maryland um, and DC uh, into the summit because for budget reasons, they can sort of come in on their own and we don't have to pay for a flight. Uh, so all that being said, so far we have about I think 85 applications. Um, I think sort of at a maximum will take 30 people, but that's including the Maryland and Virginia people um, who can drive in. Um, so any questions on the explaining? Catherine, I see your hand is up virtually. I don't know if it's up in person too, but yeah, go ahead. Uh do you already have set talking points for what you're going to say to the Congress people? Because Nope. My friend's grandpa is a kidney patient, and he, I asked him what he'd want someone like me or another ambassador to say to Congress, and he said that he needs them to talk about the staffing shortages at dialysis centers because mm -hmm. he's they're changing out staff pretty much by the month, he said, and they're having people fly in all the way from Florida, so... If there's any way that any of the accepted ambassadors could mention that to their Congress member and see if there's a way to help fix that, please do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any questions about Kenya Election Summit? Okay. I will thank everyone for joining us for the briefing uh, today.